Welcome to the first installment of the Grayson University Humanities Podcast Series. I'm Tim Robbins, Assistant Professor of English at Graceland University. For today's conversation, I'm joined by my colleague, Professor Daniel Platt, and we're talking with Ognan Zamirsky. Ognan received his bachelor's degree in English literature from Graceland College in 2000. He's now a lector of translation and interpretation in the Department of English at St. Cyril and Methodius University in Skopje, Macedonia. Ognan has just published the first Macedonian translation of Herman Melville's 1851 classic, Moby Dick. I'm Tim. I'm Dan. Thanks for so much for staying up so late. <laughs> well, no, uh, it's, it's actually early for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's but great. Tonight is young. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'm excited, Dan. Yeah, I'm excited, excited to hear about this. So. Yeah. Maybe start with just a very brief background about how you yeah. ended up at Graceland, your relationship with Barbara and John Wallace and uh, Jerry. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's yeah. I, these are these are good memories. <laughs> so uh, back in 1997, uh, there was an announcement about a scholarship that uh, Ambassador Menzies. Uh, was awarding jointly with Graceland College, and um, it was Graceland College at the time. Mm. And um, I was a bit skeptical about, uh, you know, you know the, the 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 criteria and stuff like that because not everyone everything went uh, smoothly here. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that there would be corruption and stuff like that, you know, yeah. as things were and sometimes I've still done. <laughs> yeah, I, I did all the tests. I um, we had to submit all sorts of documents and and I got the scholarship together with ten other people from 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 Macedonia. Huh. And so we all flew uh, uh, to you know uh, the states and we, we spent two or three two years. Um, there and it was great and uh, I loved it and and then I met Barbara mm -hmm. who was my English lit uh, 19th century English literature uh -huh. teacher uh -huh. and there was John Wallace as, as well and Jerry Denusio and um, as time went by there was war in in the neighborhood of Macedonia mm -hmm. and you know we were all alone there thousands of miles mm -hmm. from home and you know Grayson is a small community compared to the university here right. uh, and uh, but nevertheless you do get friends you know you make friends and but there's a certain limit to where you actually um, how far and or how close you get mm. with, with with students and friends and etc. And uh, we all lack these sense of security because they were bombing just mm. uh, uh, across the border, and there were hundreds of thousands of refugees mm. flooding Macedonia. Right. So we were so frightened about what was going on here. And there you have Barbara and John and you know doing really subtle acts of kindness, kindness nothing mm -hmm. condescending or, mm -hmm. you know, good pity, but small, tiny acts of kindness that really count. And, you know, it, you get that sense of belonging and, of, you know, I was 20-something at, at the time and you, you still need a mother yeah. or a dad even, even then, you know. Right. Uh, especially when you're so far away, and and somehow I, I did um, get to feel that I had somebody really close there, and they opened their homes to us, mm -hmm. and then you get into so, all sorts of um, discussions about literature, life, and, and and jokes and stuff like that. So it, it was really great, and I, I and I got to love them very much, and I I, I remember them fondly, and I talked to Barbara, and, and uh, sometimes we. Late John, uh, yeah. yeah. And was it um, was it Jerry Denuzio who first introduced you to Moby Dick? Yeah, well, yes. That, that's another interesting story. Um, uh, Jerry was uh, he he taught nineteenth century American literature, and of course, I was an English major here, 
mm-hmm. where I started um, uh, English language and studying. I was also an English major there, and uh, Jerry's class was really great, and I loved I loved the way he spoke. I hope he speaks that way <laughs> uh, still, and uh, he, he was really calm and, and, you know, his language was really rich. And so he, and I had, a, I, I had a friend who's n- now lives in New York, also from Macedonia, uh, Zlatko, and we were in his class together. And every now and then we would, you know, we would, we would hear an interesting phrase that we didn't know and, or that sounded really great and we would just comment <laughs> translated in class while he was speaking so he would give us a look you know <laughs> what are you doing and he didn't know that we were actually admiring him <laughs> and talking about the way he spoke so it all it may have seemed uh, rude to him so Jerry uh, right. apologies uh, for that for that, but we were really admiring you, and so, um, and uh, we, and, you know, we read all sorts of, of stuff, and we read excerpts from uh, Moby Dick, and those excerpts were not enough for me, so I, I bought the entire book, because we, we used the Norton, the Norton uh, anthology, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I said, well, this is not enough, like, I need to read the whole thing, and I did, and uh, working in the library, Wow. Helps, you know, uh-huh. because I I, 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 I was a li- librarian for, for, for a year or so, so it helps when you're there and you can read it. So so he introduced me to Moby Dick and I loved it and he covers it really great. And uh, I said, I have to translate this thing into Macedonian. When did you it start? Was, yeah. It was, it had been translated actually. But in 1982, but uh, not directly from English, which oh. I came to understand later. Oh. It was a very poor translation. Interesting. Yeah. And, you know, a translation from a translation is, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, you know, talking to somebody's shadow. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah. So how, when did you start the translation project then? Well, uh, I... I read Moby Dick in 1999, okay. and and I said I have to translate this, but it wouldn't be so easy. You see, this guy, Herman Melville, <laughs> uh, had touched virtually every word in the English dictionary, <laughs> and I didn't know every word in the Macedonian dictionary, <laughs> and uh, perhaps and many of the words he had used did not have translation equivalents mm. in the Macedonian dictionary. The Macedonian language may have had the words, but they were not in the dictionary. And so I, I, ha- and I, I realized, actually, it's, it wasn't a problem of the Macedonian language. It was the, the problem of my lack mm. of knowledge sure. of that language, my native tongue. And, you know, it makes you humble when, when you read stuff. You say, OK, fine, I understand this from context. And I, I, I can I can get the drift of the of the thought and the meaning from context, and uh, but not when you translate. You have to get every word, you know, uh-huh. and not only every word, but every subtle way it relates to other uh, words. And uh-huh. and so I got I started to learn Macedonian, mm-hmm. and the best way to do it was by reading. Uh, lots of Macedonian stuff, Mm -hmm. going to, talking to old people and writing down every new phrase, every word, every collocation, every idiom, every saying that I came across. And I learned that these peasants somewhere were actually great teachers. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, it makes you even humble, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and so uh, there was the problem of maritime terminology. Mm. Macedonia is a landlocked country, <laughs> so we never had a fleet, uh-huh. and so uh, I needed to 
see what to do with that and how to how, how do you translate something uh, into a landlocked language and uh, I decided that I had to speak with fishermen because we have lakes quite uh, three mm. lakes uh, two of them are rather big really and uh, they do sail there and, and, and so I, I, I said I'll, I'll talk to, um, to fishermen and see how they speak, how they spoke, and and I did that, and then I travelled the Adriatic coast because my great my uh, grandfather is from um, Montenegro, mm. was from Montenegro, and uh, I do travel there to the Adriatic coast, mm -hmm. and I spoke to fishermen there and to sailors there, and you have to know that. <coughs> These are all Slavic languages, and there is this continuum of Slavic languages, mm -hmm. and and they're all related. In uh, so we do share the the, the vocabulary uh, to a certain degree, and so I I got to talk to old people there and write things down, and uh, then I started in, to research how the maritime terminology developed in in the English language. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I came to understand that um, it, it was an internet. It, it, it came from an international language, from a lingua franca. Mm, uh -huh. They spoke in the in the Mediterranean because merchants had to understand each other, so words travelled. And then I I I, I, I opened the. the Great Oxford Dictionary of the English Language. <laughs> you have it's on historical uh, grounds, you know, yeah. uh, and you have the etymology. And I realized that, like as in Macedonia, so in English, the the the, the, the words denoting um, parts of the vessel came from land, mm. actually, and. Most of the spars and poles and beams on the masts actually uh, are are named with words that mean branch. Mm. Okay? Okay. And the masts are uh, the words for masts are all all mean tree mm. or okay. or trunk, you know. But then the, the these words in the English language are from Old Norse. From Swedish, from Old Danish, from Middle French, mm -hmm. Middle English. Yeah. But they all mean mean either trunk, <laughs> branch, okay, or something. And 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 if you if you if you uh, if you investigate further, you see that these are all words that are used in roof construction, horns and stuff like that. Yeah. And so. The, the words that fishermen used in Macedonia also originated from lands and from roof construction and from farming implements mm -hmm. like windlass. Okay, yeah, that's you have that on wells, yeah, right, and you have it on a ship. Yeah, so you you haul in uh, an anchor, and you also use it to haul in to haul the bucket. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So these are all farming implements that people used before they had ships. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, over centuries, these were moved onto ships. And the ship grew like a structure, like a house. So you have a basement, actually, and a roof and a structure there. Huh. And, and languages work in the same way. <sighs> You know, people are smart. Yeah. They think pretty much the same all over the world. And so you, you can see how these languages converge and meet at a certain point. And, and, and that's what, that was my discovery. And so I did, I did the same. Now, I had to compensate for some, something that had not happened in Macedonia spontaneously over centuries. So I had to come up with this terminology myself. And it worked because I did borrow from the, 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 the language of the fishmen and and use the same model and it worked. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a really incredible story. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. I mean, the, and it took me 10 years. To <laughs> yeah, that was my <laughs> follow-up question. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay. I mean, two things that I just want to like, that are amazing about that story. One, Melville's, Melville's language was like already international, mm. right? Yeah. Because the, yeah. from what you found. And searching for an author who's now become the author of American like letters, uh, yeah. fiction, sent you deeper into Macedonian culture and language, which I think is just fascinating. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, that's, that's, an, that's one, you've touched upon a very important point mm. um, in translation. What language you translate from? Do you translate from one language or from a number of languages? Mm -hmm. Now, if you translate Herman Melville, who relied, who relied a lot on um, on John Milton, okay, mm. who who admired John Milton mm. and Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. Actually, look, it begins with a quote from <laughs> from, from, yeah. from Paradise Lost, uh, and John Milton had Latinized the English language, mm. right? That's what Ben Johnson objected to, and, and <laughs> you know they, they criticized him for that. So he actually translated also from Latin. Yeah. And you also translate from uh, the the languages of the of all the islands that Melville mm -hmm. had visited, because he did use many words from from there. And then then Melville actually revived idioms. Mm, you wow. see, you have you take idioms for, for granted, but they were at at a certain point in time they were metaphors, or some. There were, there were gems that some genius had th thought of, and they were new. And all of a sudden, uh, and, and over time, they become petrified uh, mm -hmm. phrases that you use in everyday language. But then you have Melville, who puts them back in context. And, you know, between the devil and the deep blue sea, <laughs> yeah. the maritime uh, thing, you know, the devil is one of the beams, oh, the wow. outside of the ship's hull, and the, the blue sea is there. And imagine you being a sailor and having to, to scrub there and clean the hull of all the barnacles and stuff that make it uh, run slow, sail slow, slowly. And you, you had to get rid of those. And it was a hell of a job <laughs> doing that in high seas, you know, because they didn't ask you. They didn't, you know, if, if you complained and said, well, I'd rather do it tomorrow because <laughs> or, uh, we'll have uh, smooth seas. They say, no. You go there, no. <laughs> yeah. so, and, and he used all these idioms uh, that, that he revived and, and made, them, made them alive. And you have to identify every, um, every place where he does actually that. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and then you don't translate it with a Macedonian idiom. Because he defamiliarizes it, mm. he, he revives it, and you have to do the same. Mm. You, don't, you don't use a petrified phrase that actually is commonplace, because what, he's, what he does is no longer commonplace. Yeah, I mean, that's, that sort of, well, I mean, I have two questions. I don't know if you have one. I mean, one which is practical about Moby Dick, which was, um, what were the real, what were the sections or chapters or moments that caused you real trouble? The most, the most trouble. Yeah, it's the most. I mean, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> all of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, um, Melville combined the Quaker idiom <laughs> with the, the idiom of the sailors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then the Quakers uh, talk like, like, uh, you know, in an English from Elizabeth, Elizabethan times. Mm -hmm. And now you have to have that in mind how they actually pronounced things. Mm. The Irish rules, right? Mm. Yeah. That's how they spoke in England uh, in Queen Elizabeth's time, in Shakespeare's time, actually. Mm -hmm. And so you have to fight, strike that, do the same in Macedonian, actually, and, and um, use archaic phrases okay. as well, archaic language. And you have to resort to old church Slavonic. Mm. You do that to make make these characters sound like Quakers using biblical 
phrases in biblical in biblical language, and and there, there were in every on, on virtually every page there is an instance like that. One of the most difficult uh, um, chapters was uh, well, I actually have it here. Okay. Uh, uh, it's uh, the, the the spirit spouse. Mm -hmm. It's chapter fifty one. Well, uh, it it's full of alliteration. Every ah. every word, every every in, in, in the second paragraph, there's the sounds the, the s sound, which makes you uh, hear the sea. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, shall I read it? Sure, sure. Yeah, you can edit it out always. No, <laughs> no way. That's it. Uh, let me put on my glasses. Just, just a few sentences. It, says, it was while gliding through these latter waters that one serene and moonlight night, when all the waves rolled by like scrolls of silver, and by their soft, suffusing sea things made what seemed a silvery silence, not a solitude. <laughs> On such a silent night, a silvery jet was seen far in advance of the white bubbles at the bow, lit up by the moon. It looked celestial, seen some plumes and glittering god uprising from the sea. Fedala first described this jet. For of these, moon, these moonlit night, moonlight nights, it was his wont to mount to the mainmast and stand a lookout there with the same precision as if it had been day. And etc. etc. Mm -hmm. You see, you have this. Yeah. Yeah. This wasn't a boat with an engine. <laughs> yeah. It's quiet, and you heard the sea and the, the hum of the of the sails, and you have to trans transpose this into the Macedonian, and you have to use words beginning with C. And use okay. The, the same achieve the same alliteration, and that is actually on every single page, and it's poetry. <gasps> yeah. I mean, are things like so? Alliteration has been a mark of English style for you know centuries. Is it, is it true in Macedonia? Yeah. Same? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Every every literature does it. It's, okay. it's a useful device, and the English didn't invent it. Sure, of course. <laughs> Just that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and also, um, it was all. It's an, another thing that a translator uh, has to has to be very careful about. Is recognizing um, intertextuality mm -hmm. when Melville actually refers to earlier literature, such as the Odyssey or Shakespeare. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious. You mentioned Melville's debt to Paradise Lost, and I'm curious. Did you find yourself looking at um, Macedonian translations of of exactly. Milton? <laughs> That's where I'm where I'm getting it actually. Yeah, but you have to recognize it. Because it's not always marked with a, or explained in a footnote, mm -hmm. and and so yes, you have to do it. <sighs> and fortunately, the translator of Paradise Lost, Dragi Mihailovsky, is uh, was my mentor. Oh, oh. learned so much <laughs> from him, and so it was a it was a very fortunate coincidence no. that his masterpiece he actually he actually translated the complete works of Shakespeare as well. Oh. And so, it's a very happy coincidence that these uh, that the lines from Paradise Lost open Moby Dick, and here I am, you know, translating <laughs> Moby Dick, and and yes, and when when for example, uh, Ishmael says um, uh, about um, some books that they were. Full of sound and Leviathanism, mm -hmm. signifying nothing. <laughs> it's a direct reference to Macbeth. <laughs> full of sound and life, but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more, etc. Uh -huh. et full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Yeah. And you have to recognize that if you don't, you've missed an important thing. And then you refer back to the translator, uh, to the translator by another translator and you you have to adjust it because Mabel, Melville had, had done the same 
And also he refers to the Odyssey and, and yeah, dude, the Odyssey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, curious I'm curious about whether um, your personal uh, interpretation of the novel uh, affected okay. your translation. I mean, your sense of certain characters and how they fit in, or um, different kinds of lenses that you use to interpret the book as a reader or as a lover of literature. Did you find that that biased your translation in any way, or was it hard to get past that? Well, um, I, I worked on it for 10 years, <laughs> and being a translator, you have to be hysterical. You know? <laughs> and not only hysterical, but also... What, what's the word? Um, the uh, schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. You have to get from one character into another character, mm -hmm. and you have to change the language. And Ahab speaks in a certain way, and then you have Stub. Yes. <laughs> and, and and Flask and all these characters, or Bildad, who mixes biblical and and and, and colloquial mm -hmm. and, and and whatnot, and you have to do that and. Um, but actually, what, what you're faithful to is that which uh, Melville abandons in the commonplace, okay? The, the commonplace that he abandons, and that is what affects you, and you're faith, faithful to that, and, uh, and you you have to adjust the style to the style of the um, of the original, of Melville's language. If it's archaic, then you are archaic, mm -hmm. and your translation. It, I mean, does this answer your yes, question? Yes, yeah. I think your, um, your observations about matching tone more than uh, meaning, often more you, you go with the one over the other sometimes. Yeah. I think that is important. Um, and that justify some of the decisions that you might make as a translator. Well, y yes, uh, if, if we can dwell on this a bit longer, can we? Yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, oftentimes you don't deal with meaning because meaning lies in the dictionary. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the denotative and connotative meaning. Mm -hmm. What you have to deal with is the lack of meaning. Okay, or the multiplicity of meanings, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or the multitude of meanings. And oftentimes, you have to leave the text as open to interpretation as the original. Mm -hmm. Because if you wish to capture a single meaning, then you have to decide. And oftentimes, the narrator says something that may mean one thing or that may reflect his, in, his or her intention, but the words combine in such a way that they also mean other things. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that was the intention of the author is uncertain. Oftentimes, things come out as Freudian slips, etc., mm -hmm. in, in ordinary speech, right? In sure. everyday speech. But when you write things down and you re edit them and edit, and edit them, a lot remains unsaid. And you have to ensure that this happens in the translation as well. And if, 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 if you use a neologism or if you use a certain word in a, in a, in a new way, then you disturb the commonplace, the, the domesticating uh, powers of, of everyday usage. And you have to do it in translation as well. And it's, it happens in Moby Dick all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you mentioned uh, in our exchange uh, about how important it was to, as you said before, defamiliarize even the Macedonian language for, the, for readership. Based upon my question, which was, wouldn't your aim as a translator in some way to be make a text accessible for an audience that wouldn't otherwise read it? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's that, that, that's a uh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Thanks for asking the, the question <laughs> because, um, yeah, uh, in that's especially the case in American and English okay. uh, translation literature uh, and publishing uh, texts. Translations are judged by their fluency. Mm -hmm. So if if it's if it reads fluently, smoothly, then it's a good translation. Uh -huh. 
but that's not true. <laughs> doesn't read fluently in English. Right. <laughs> yeah. How difficult is Moby Dick for native speakers? I'm curious. <laughs> for me, I'm still impenetrable, basically. I don't know. I taught it uh, last semester, and students were challenged by it. Um, and I think a lot of them were rewarded by it, but rewarded because of the great difficulty that of the undertaking. And I think exactly. that bears out in your yeah, translation other, philosophy. I, yeah, otherwise languages don't grow and people don't grow, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, so making it easy for the reader is the worst thing you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't do that. You, you, make, you don't break sentences in half because Melville has decided to, you know, keep going for a page or two, right? <laughs> you say, okay, this is a single sentence uh, and it, uh, my reader will find it difficult uh, to, to read. Well, who are you to judge the intelligence <laughs> of a reader, right? Okay? You're not, it's not your place. Yeah. Uh, and so, and you, you owe it not to Melville, but to the text, because Melville is dead, right? He's in the, <laughs> in the ground. Uh, but you owe, owe it to the text. And so you go on and you run on for a page or two in a single sentence. Um, and, and there is no average reader. Who's the average reader? Is it the farmer in Iowa or mm -hmm. the, the surfer in California? Mm -hmm. Or is it um, a, 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 a professor with a PhD degree? Or is it, is it a, a, a farmer? Who doesn't have a PhD yeah. uh, in literature? So you know, Melville didn't concern himself with the reader. He's demonstrated it by using <laughs> by, by writing such long sentences. <laughs> and and why should I do that? You know, uh -huh. Why should I make it easier? Why should I insult my reader? Okay, and and that that goes for uh, vocabulary. You, you don't you don't translate. Um, uh, a difficult word, a word that doesn't exist in the Macedonian dictionary because the concept perhaps doesn't exist as it is as it is in the English language. You have to coin a new word using uh, the instruments in your language and word formation and stuff. And and th this this is shown, for example, and uh, you, should, you know your lit majors. I'm, I'm sure you know that kennings uh, are. Uh, the trademark of um, old English and of uh, modern English as well, you know, and um, and so Melville relied a lot of Kenning on Kennings, uh, which date back to Beowulf, and so you have the whale uh -huh. road or whale path, right? And but it was Hranrad. In, in, in all English, but modern English has to conjoin these two elements of this compound word with a hyphen. Old English didn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. It was a single word. Macedonian word formation allows me to do that, mm -hmm. and I can invent and coin words. And so, you see how old English is, old English is a dead language, right? It survives in certain layers of the English language. But then in Macedonian, it is revived. Why? Mm. Because the word formation reflects the Old English, mm. although they belong to different groups. And now you have Old English rejuvenated and living in a Macedonian translation. Mm. So you see how languages grow. And thereby, I introduce new words into the Macedonian language, mm. which are readily understandable to the reader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It's amazing so, to think of Melville's text then growing language into the future. I mean, that's really profound. I think. Yeah, and 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 th that is the purpose of translation, and that's the great project that Melville talks about in his book, like the Cathedral in Cologne. Mm. See, yeah. great works are never great uh, projects are never finished by a single generation. Mm. They, these are minor. Works that you, that a single person can can complete, okay? Yeah. They do not last very long. Well, 
that's not absolutely correct. <laughs> but it, it relies on earlier works, and it, uh, Melville's book is a phase in the development of literature and of languages. And so Melville ensures the survival of, of, of languages and of many English words, actually. Mm. He's been praised for that. And so translations help, helps these. And this has happened with, with, with all these archaic words that, with that, that I've had to use, and even modern ones that are uh, frowned upon because they, 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 they are of Greek origin, for example, and they say, oh, okay, that's a foreign word. Well, well it's a good thing. Why? Because the uh, Macedonian, we have a number of words for, for anchor, and the, the English word anca is from Greek, ankira, mm -hmm. and in Italian it's ancora. But we have uh, a, a word that uh, derives from another uh, Greek word, sideros, which also means anchor, but is no longer used in the Greek language, and it meant iron, iron. Yeah. And iron is a, uh, actually a metaphor, metaphor. Mm. Uh, or rather, uh, a synecdoche, uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> because this part, the iron, stands for the whole thing, mm -hmm. for the device, yeah. right? And or metonymy, whatever. <laughs> and, so, um, and so, this word survives in the Macedonian language with that meaning, that sense, but no longer in the Greek language, mm -hmm. right? Greeks yeah. don't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. And see how how these words shift from one language to another, and they survive. And the ultimate project of or purpose of translation is the survival of languages and the growth of languages and their potential unification into a single language mm. in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. That seems well, like a good. good that seems like a good time to ask you about your next project to kind of build on that. If you, if that's a. A question you you're willing to answer? Or just... <laughs> yeah, my my next project is Herman Melville's Billy Budd. Ah, oh wow, Benito wow. Sereno, and uh, and a few other things by, by Herman Melville. So I, I'm 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 keen on on on, on working on that too. Yeah. I feel like the Macedonians need a Bartleby, maybe. <laughs> oh yes, Bartleby the Scrivener. <laughs> I my chimney. <laughs> Bartleby, yeah. I've actually translated Bartleby the Scrivener. Oh, neat. Oh. Yeah, but it was in preparation for, for, for Moby Dick, and I've started working on uh, on Billy Budd as okay. well. Uh, but I did it uh, in the early stages of my preparations. It was just getting into the, the feel, getting into the style of Melville, and I didn't intend to publish them immediately. They're in my drawer, or rather, my <laughs> computer. They haven't seen the light of day yet, because I don't want to publish them. Because I, I I've now matured uh -huh. to, to to work on them. But they were a preparation. So, Battle with the Scrivener, uh, Benito, uh, Sereno, uh, Billy Budd, um, yeah. And there's another thing that I want to say. If you have, if you have time, oh yeah. Uh, translation is a, is a is important not only because it, it brings Melville or Shakespeare into Macedonian and people have good things to read and good stories because the story of Moby Dick is you know we've we've heard other stories about the hubris of challenging mm -hmm. God and and, and 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 nature or call it whatever you want and eventually you know you die okay in the end of the book or after the end of the book you die so they lived heavily Happily ever after, but they die. They mm -hmm. die. Okay, so every story ends with death. And but what what's important is the things in the middle, you know. And in translation, what is important is that uh, translation affects life. It's 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 ideology. It's 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 politics. Translation is politics mm -hmm. because the word you choose to use. And the way you translate things affect institutions, affect life. Um, if you use commonplace, uh, everyday language, that, um, that which you think is natural for your language, 
then you're actually domesticating foreign cultures and you shouldn't do that mm -hmm. because uh, South American literature is not Ameri United States literature. The language they use there is different, right? The concepts, the approach to things is different. If you make it run smoothly in, mass in, in, in English, then you're depriving what is... Uh, the, the text or, or your audience, your readership, from what is typical of that other country, culture that you're trying to bring into the English language. And, you know, domesticating things, making, making it sound uh, English, yeah. is a colonialist thing to do, mm -hmm. right? You colonize other uh, cultures. Uh, you adjust them to your own culture rather than letting them affect your culture and enrich it. And, and enrich it. So if you do that, if you make everything sound English, it means that the whole word is English. Mm -hmm. It isn't, is it? No. Or, or American, it isn't. It's not, not the whole world is Macedonian. I've had to let English or Melville affect the Macedonian language. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because that's the only way a language can grow and mm. a culture can grow if you receive other concepts. Yeah. What you like, you take. What you don't, you abandon. <laughs> that's really good. That's, yeah, that's terrific. In closing, I would say that okay, it was my it was my uh, great project to work on 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 Nova Dig, and it it made it helped me grow as a person. I was I was a different person when I started. I met a lot of people while I translated, but it all started at Graceland. <laughs> you know, uh, you know f in in the freezing cold, you know? <laughs> uh, and you know I was there tucked under my my uh, my cover, and and reading Moby Dick and and saying oh. I have to translate, and it all started there. And every time I look at this, I look at this book or, or my translation, which I will show now. Yeah. It's in two volumes, actually. Oh wow! Yeah, it is complete with uh, with a uh, with everything with a uh, with a prologue with the with the exits. And mm. It all started there, and whenever I open it, I have uh, the Grace Graceland's uh, campus mm. in my. Just comes to mind. That's amazing. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank well, you, Andrew, really. for for taking the time to, to listen to all this. This is brilliant. This is, yeah. yeah, this, this is, is my so pleasure. Much. Yeah, yeah. right. A blast. So it was great to hear you talk about Moby Dick, and I feel like you've given me a lot to chew on. And yeah.